Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Courtney Hughes-Lord and I am co-hosting our webinar today. Today is the first session in a series of webinars that we've curated to explore the emerging trends and best practice in managing sustainability through a people-centric lens. In today's webinar, we will be discussing the dilemmas and the opportunities of intentional organisation design to drive sustainability outcomes. And we have two wonderful guests uh, joining us from NIB and Evolution Mining. Before we commence, in the spirit of reconciliation, I acknowledge the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. I pay respect to their elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. We want to make today's webinar um, an interactive conversation and we will have time for some of your questions at the end of our webinar discussions. Over to you, Ephraim. Hello, everyone. We are absolutely thrilled to uh, be here today. My name is Ephraim Patrick. I'm a partner here based in Sydney um, at Mercer, working in workforce transformation, which includes organization design, workforce planning analytics, and everything related to change. And Courtney and I are really pleased and thrilled to have two guests here today. It's Rosalind Toms, who is the Group Executive for Legal and Chief Risk Officer at NIV. Rosalind joined NIV in 2011 and leads the legal risk compliance, governance, community, and sustainability functions across the NIV group. Uh, Rosalind is also the company secretary of NIB Holdings. And in addition, Rosalind is a volunteer director of NIB Foundation, which is NIB's charitable organization. And I don't know, Rosalind, how you do all of that. In addition, you are a director of the Risk Management Institute of Australasia. Welcome, we're, we're so pleased to have you here. And then we have Fiona Murphy who is Evolution Mining's Vice President of Sustainability, overseeing safety, health, environment, risk, social responsibility, uh, uh, and the social responsibility portfolio, reporting to the executive chair. Her career has focused on working within high risk operations, mainly within the oil and gas and mining sectors, leading transformations for organizations such as Shell, DuPont, and Viva Energy. She is really passionate about sustainability, underpinned by a genuine care for people and the communities in which they live. Fiona is known for creating a trusted relationship and connects strategy with delivery to help unlock potential. Fiona, it's wonderful to have you here. Um, so in our webinar today, we'll be covering three things. We'll talk about the five dimensions that you can consider when designing your organization and roles to achieve sustainable outcomes. And we'll explore and hear from Roslyn and Fiona where they are on the journey to a more intentional approach to designing and delivering a sustainable outcome. And then we would love to capture your input. We, you know, if you have questions, please submit them in the chat box. We're also interested in your ideas and there are a couple of polls that we, we have in the session as well. So, Let's set the scene for our discussion today with two data points from, uh, from the latest research. The first insight is from our 2022 Global Talent Trends study, which kept, uh, captures over 10,000 voices. And what we heard from business executives is that 64 are really 64% are really concerned about the fo their focus and their organization's ability to effectively embed sustainability goals into their business transformation plans. So it's really top of mind um, for business executives. Um, we also heard in a second data point from a recent uh, corporate governance study um, that, ex that explored the question whether sustainability agendas are actually driven by external stakeholders or internal stakeholders that um, the board agenda um, is really has a has a very strong internal drive, and it's probably no surprise that almost eighty percent of board members confirm that the frequency of sustainability on board agendas has significantly increased in the last eighteen months. Um, 
there is obviously a lot of emphasis on sustainability in organizations. And one might think that the work of the, all the work of sustainability advocates, analysts, and the investors, uh, that work is starting to pay dividends. We'd love to hear from you as well as our participants today. What do you think in your context, in your organization, what are the top drivers of focus on su sustainability in your organization? And we've got a poll coming up uh, that my colleague Courtney is um, observing and watching. We'd love to hear from you. Um, what, are, what is the top sustainability focus and driver in your organization? Great, thanks, Ephraim. So um, you can uh, see the poll come up on your screen there. And so if you select the top driver of sustainability um, in your organization, so we're interested to understand, is it you know, customer demand um, driven? Is it about linking to purpose? Um, expectations perhaps from employees, candidates, shareholders, the board, um, perhaps it's leadership incentives or um, stemming from legislative requirements. We'll just give you a moment to complete that. All right, the results are in. So interestingly, the top, um, the, the top response was reinforcing the organization's purpose, which I guess is not surprising. And then we also had, um, up quite high is uh, customer demand and growth opportunities. So um, interesting, you know, that one, I think that we often hear about customer demand and expectations for um, sustainability. And then, you know, I guess um, it's interesting to see whether that actually stacks up with, um, you know, people uh, voting with their feet um, and what actually drives some of that choices. So um, thanks for that. Ephraim, I might hand over to you now because I think you've got some questions for our panellists. Yeah, I'd love to, to hear from both Fiona and Roslyn. I mean, Fiona, you mentioned in the previous discussion that sustainability means different things to different people uh, uh, and different companies. So what, is, what does sustainability mean to you at Evolution Mining? And how does it reflect, you know, how does your top priority reflect to what just came through from at the audience here in the webinar. Yeah, look, it was um, was really interesting just to to see what what came back. I guess it wasn't a big surprise to see around organisations purpose, um, because that would, you know, particularly link also to, to what drives us. Yeah, yes, I have said uh, quite openly that sustainability does mean different things to to different people, but also to different companies. And so why it connects to an organization's purpose uh, and our purpose is really around value creation. Uh, and it's for all of our stakeholders. So, you know, what I thought was interesting was, you know, shareholders' expectations weren't as high as what I thought they might be uh, in that, but maybe that comes as a one or a two as opposed to the number one. Um, for us, it is around purpose. Uh, that's always been linked really closely to our values, which were more organic in the early days. Um, but it is then linked to that creation of value for all of our stakeholders. So really our people, uh, the communities in which we operate and, and our shareholders. And they colour the view of the board. So, you know, it's kind of interesting on those top drivers because uh, I think a thing that will come out of today is really around the integrated elements of, of sustainability and what it means to us. Um, and the other piece around for evolution, and it's part of my portfolio, so health, safety, environment, risk and social responsibility, you know, are really around how we uh, help define sustainability within the context of evolution. Uh, so, you know, I, I think the themes are, are very real. Um, and it was just really interesting that there are very, uh, you know, quite a few key uh, top drivers that, that came out as a theme for for all of the participants today. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Fiona. And, and Roslyn, just reflecting on what Fiona said, I was wondering what sustainability drivers are on top of your list at, at NIB. Thanks, Ephraim. Yeah, like Fiona, I'm not um, surprised that an organization's purpose is the number one driver. And that's certainly at NIB, we have five pillars of sustainability. 
but one is very much linked to our purpose of your better health and our overarching strategy as a business, um, which is P2P, pay at a partner, and that's population health. And um, as a health insurer, we are transitioning from just being a financier to partnering with the communities in which we work and operate to help people achieve your better health. And with populations, helping them to identify their risks and how they can modify them um, to achieve that overarching your better health. But in terms of the other um, focuses there, you know, natural environment is something that's important to us, economic development, our employees, community cohesion. But I think ultimately, you know, if you're delivering on your purpose, you're going to meet your shareholders' expectations, the community's expectations, and really good governance is also also makes good business sense. Yeah, it's 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 great to hear from both of you. You know, some of the trade-offs in a way that you that you potentially also have to make in as an organisation, and and you know, in the way you focus on that, and that kind of leads us to the the notion of an intentional design. Um, obviously. There are many, many different ways to go about it, but um, Courtney will briefly just reinforce that message around intentionality. Mm. Yes, so um, for many organisations, um, sustainability came about through PR, and so this might have been in response to specific adv advocacy or interest groups um, and also reporting necessities. And what we've seen is that things were often bolted on over time, and this sometimes resulted in sustainability roles in strange parts of the organisation um, with a lack of clear alignment, metrics and accountabilities for those roles. So the key question for organisations is, how do we shift to be more intentional and strategic in the way that we design and deliver sustainability outcomes? Yeah, and in of Fiona and, and Ross, you both came to sustainability through slightly different career paths. And, um, and, and that's what makes sustainability also such a really vibrant and interesting space, isn't it, at the moment? Because you have this diversity of backgrounds and skills and experiences. I'd love to hear from both of you about your personal connection to sustainability and also where your organization sits on that journey towards greater uh, intentional focus on it. Who would like to go first? I'm happy to jump in. Um, yeah, look, Courtney, as you said, it's certainly sustainability has matured quite significantly over even the past five odd years. Uh, in our business five years ago, it did sit in investor relations. It was very much driven by reporting um, to the market. But we've seen over the past few years, is that me? <laughs> no? um, a very big shift within the business where we're becoming much more deliberate. We have set up um, a business unit for sustainability. Um, and I guess in terms of my remit, I came to it really, I took over the role of Chief Risk Officer five years ago and then a few different functions moved um, under my remit, sustainability being one and community being another. And they all, you know, seem to sit well within my business unit being risk management as well. I think in terms of being more deliberate, we stepped back a few years ago and really took the company's values, what our purpose was and how we could achieve something in the sustainability space and really have an impact in the communities that we're working in, the business that we're working within. And that's why, as I said, population health is probably one of our number one sustainability pillars. Ah, oh, so interesting. Thanks, Rose. How about you, Fiona? Um, look, my personal connection uh, to sustainability probably came out of um, a sad event. My my brother-in-law was working on a shutdown and um, part of that shutdown, it, um, a crane hit the platform he was working on and he fell and, and he died. Um, that's helped shape a lot of, you know, the, the passion that I have and the drivers that I have. Um, and when we think about sustainability um, from the early days, I mean, often we talked about, you know, the health and safety um, so for me, that was my entrance and, and I've really shifted my personal focus to then going, well, how do we actually make the environments that we work in 
rather than, you know, go home the way we arrived, how about we even um, contribute and we go home better than what we arrived? And that, that also includes the communities in which we operate. And so, you know, it was a natural fit for me starting in the risk and the safety and the environment space, which is where I kind of came from, that communities wouldn't ordinarily grow in there. And I think it's over the, only over the last maybe 10 years that we've started to use the word sustainability. Um, so for me, it was, a, it was quite organic. And even if I think about the history for evolution, um, it's been organic for them as well. I mean, it's very purpose driven organization. It is about, you know, a low cost goal producer really focused on that environment and socially responsible way. Um, and those, you know, we've got some very, very clear values, uh, which is one of the things that, you know, I was really interested in joining uh, Evolution on was it was very purpose driven and anchored in those values. And those values are around safety, excellence, you know, accountability and respect. So there's that really clear linkage. But what's been interesting in that journey is that, you know, two years ago when my role was created, um, it was really in that effort to recognise that deliberate nature. So, you know, really making sure that rather than the organic element of that broad remit, that also recognising you need to be quite intentional about where you're going. It is getting more complex. How do we bring all of that together in a way that's going to get us where we need to be in the future? So the con personal connection for me around how do we actually have an impact and make it a better place for our communities, you know, for, for our people? Um, and then, you know, us being quite intentional about where we're going um, is really just also a reflection of the complexity that's now surrounding so many different elements of whatever sustainability means um, for the communities in which you operate, but equally your own company remit. And I think what's really interesting in some of the conversations we're already starting to have is, um, yes, it means different things to different people, but there is a really strong thread or I'll say golden thread, I'll put a plug in for gold, a golden thread for how we're all kind of connected as people and, and communities. Um, and But it is that intentional shift that we made quite deliberately two years ago in the creation of this role in recognising there's some really big problems we need to solve um, and we need to really look at that in a very intentional way. Well, thanks, Fiona, and thanks for sharing such a personal story. It's uh, clear to see, um, you know, that, that passion behind, um, you know, where you're, where you're taking your career. So thank you for sharing. Yeah, uh, thank you so much. And, and by the way, apologies, we had a a fire alarm in the building <laughs> just now it's Murphy's Law you know it, it, it only happens when you're on a live webinar uh, so you know very profound <laughs> uh, messages from you from you both uh, so thank you so much um, what we'd like to do is just very briefly share with you the five dimensions that we work with clients and, and recommend clients to consider when they when they go on that journey uh, towards more intentional design and each of those dimensions, they re really represent a spectrum of choices that leaders must make. There is no right or wrong, you know, it's more about what is fit for purpose in your specific context and environment. The first one is about stakeholder engagement and how to best organize the communication with a broad variety of stakeholders, including investors and analysts, the board, the leadership team, employees, partners, suppliers, I know, Fiona, you've got a meeting with government coming up very soon, <laughs> one of those many, many stakeholders, as well as, you know, the communities, the organization is embedded in operating. And organizations need to make choices whether to focus on a select group of very primary uh, uh, stakeholders or to engage across a more diverse and often very complex group of stakeholders, I can imagine. And then the second dimension is really about organizing the spotlight. It's about choices on the breadth of your sustainability focus and scope. Will you as an organization have a primary focus, for example, on energy and climate transition? Or does your organization intend to focus on really all aspects, which would then also include ethical supply chain and modern slavery considerations, the increase, increasing need for social cohesion, equality, 
managing the, the psychosocial risks and well-being, both for your employees, but also the communities you're operating in. And then thirdly, there is the actual structure and the governance dimensions. And you might ask yourself, why is organizing accountability and oversight not the first dimension in this framework? Now, we know from our work with clients that questions on sustainability structures and governance are often answered in the context of the previous two dimensions, some of the choices that you make there. We also see investors and stakeholders increasingly paying very close attention to how organizations design their sustainability operating models to achieve optimal impact. So it's not only about size or about remit or about capability of the sustainability function, but also the governance structures, the controls, the procedures, and the support that, that you have to achieve defined strategies. Some organizations might choose to really centralize a lot of that expertise with centrally led execution of initiatives, whereas others might focus on leveraging really local grassroots initiatives with a much smaller centralized governance and reporting layer. And again, it's no right and wrong, it's about choice. Uh, what is fit for purpose in your context. Then the fourth dimension is about resource management. How sustainability talent and capability is managed and deployed across the organization. So against the backdrop of COVID, we've seen a lot of accelerated change with organizations exploring new options in the deployment of talent, including much more fluid teaming to drive sustainability outcomes. On the other end of the spectrum, organizations might see a need to articulate more stable roles in career propositions so that sustainability talent really see a pathway for them to progress within, within that space. And then finally, the fifth dimension is about organizing the numbers. How do metrics, incentives, and funding mechanisms for sustainability strategies all work together? And how are they managed across the organization? We know obviously good quality data, incentives that are linked to KBIs and funding mechanisms are really critical enablers um, for sustainability success. But conversely, we know from our research and client work that short cycle business case funding, conflicting incentives on, and sometimes limited executive visibility are some of the reasons why sustainability strategies can fall flat. So the, choices, the choice here is, is whether to embed these metrics enterprise-wide or articulate it based on specific sustainability initiatives, project by project. So I'd like to start with you, Fiona. I mean, your CEO, uh, and I think his actual title is Executive Chair, is quite aspirational in his message and discussions with journalists, and also quite aspirational um, in, in the conversations with ESG and uh, the investor community. So at Evolution Mining, which of those five dimensions requires most of your attention at the moment? I'd like to be able to give you a really simple answer and pick one. Um, unfortunately, uh, it doesn't work that way. So it, it's very integrated from, from where, where uh, we sit. Um, and it also doesn't follow a linear line either. Um, you know, I think, you know, when I, when I look at it, uh, you know, stakeholder engagement is absolutely critical. Um, but really, you link that with your structure and your governance and your focus and your, your scope. You have to have some idea about where you want to be and where you want to have impact. So I think I've said before about, you know, you need to be clear about what your purpose is. You need to be clear about where you want to have the most impact. And some of that comes out of your stakeholder engagement. So, you know, what are they telling us? You know, what are the, what are the key areas of risk that you need to be managing? What, what is their view on that? And then at the same time, you need to be building a really, really strong foundation. So, you know, if you look at those metrics elements is, well, what have you got to play with? What, you know, where are you? What's your baseline? Who are you going to align with? Um, and, you know, that's, you know, the hard data. 
but then your soft your soft elements which we all know are kind of sometimes the hardest is you know how do you resource for that how do you make sure that you know you're you're working uh with your leaders of your organization with your board but also with the very people that are doing the really great work out there and sharing those stories so all of those you know there's not just one lever that you pull it's all of them um, but you have to know where you're going to have the most impact. So for, for me, that stakeholder engagement and the focus and scope um, are really important because they help define where you actually have the most impact. Um, the one piece of keeping this short that I will call out, though, that's challenging is this slippery slope of sustainability because so many stakeholders want so many different things, particularly in that um you know in that ESG analyst community you know there's not one request there's lots of them and so I call it a slippery slope because if you try and be everything to everyone you'll never be anything to anyone and so that's why anchoring back into your purpose anchoring back into what your key stakeholders are telling you and knowing what you're there for becomes really really important um and and the last piece is you know, we run a devolved model and that means that risk is best managed closest to the source. So our operations run like mini companies, if you like, and we set the kind of framework on minimum standards. Um, why that really is important is because actually some of those needs will be different depending on the community in which you operate. And you've got to be really, really mindful what are the community needs are and those broader needs. So again, I mean, and that goes to your focus and scope, but also your stakeholder engagement. So yeah, I think that gives you. Yeah, no, that's that's. Um, um, I like where you're going with this, and and if you had to position yourself on the continuum, like on the top one, the stakeholder engagement, it seems like you've successfully made some deselections, like where you no longer focus on so much. And I know those are probably not easy um, decisions to make. Um, but what I'm hearing is you're still operating in quite a complex stakeholder environment. Yeah, they're, um, they're, all they're all material. We've done a materiality assessment. And we've bounced that off all of our key stakeholders. So they're all material, but some are more material than others in where we put our effort. Uh, and so, you know, some really that won't, won't be the same for NIB, but, you know, you look at tailing storage facilities, they're really important because they're important to the communities in which we live. Uh, and so is Indigenous engagement and, you know, health and safety. Those are, you know, really, really material. Um, cyber security is also material to us, but it sits a little bit to the left. It's really important. But, um, you know, we just have to make uh, some assessments and we do that with our stakeholders. Yeah, yeah, that's great. And, and I think we've memorised the framework. So I'll ask the question to you, Rosalind, around... Um, you know, some of the trade-offs around stakeholders that you had to do at NIB, where would you position yourself on, on that continuum? Yeah, I mean, I absolutely agree with Fiona that you can't be everything to everyone and you can't have the tail wagging the dog. Uh, likewise, we undertake a materiality assessment every few years. We've only recently just completed ours. Um, and that was really cal um, calibrating what we think is important against what our stakeholders do. So that's our members, our policyholders, our employees, the external market, other companies that we partner with. And um, it was good to see that we're all on um, the same path or the same way of thinking there. But likewise, we have to make choices. So natural environment is one of our pillars, but we wouldn't have the same level of focus as a mining company would on that. Um, you know, we're committed to becoming carbon neutral this year. We're working towards um, carbon net zero by at least uh, 2050, potentially 2040. And that's important to us, but it's not where we're going um, to get the best bang for our buck. And if I think about cybersecurity, for example, that's a really material matter for us, um, particularly given the type of sensitive information we deal with um, as a health fund, but also our strategy going forward and using data to help people make better informed choices that's critical and our stakeholders also believe that that's critical in terms of you know we have a good governance structure in place um like fiona's company we're listed we've been listed for a while now, quite a while now um and ultimately the board has oversight 
in terms of sustainability. Um, and it goes through to our risk and reputation committee and we have an internal uh, committee as well of the executive team. So there's certainly the governance structures in place. Um, as a business, we have also made the choice that pillar owners sit within the business. So it's not just being run out of my function and that the business takes ownership of their pillars. And we have a sustainability team, as I mentioned, sitting within my um, remit, but it's not a massive team. You know, you hear of some companies where they've got 50 or so people in sustainability. That's not how we operate. And it's not how we operate across most of um, our business units. We believe that it should be owned by the business um, and that they should take ownership and leverage our skills as and when they need them. Yeah, it's, it's kind of like you both um, at NAB and Evolution Mining, you both have more or less what we would call a devolved model. And, and Fiona, I think you mentioned that. So you've got a very strong governance layer, but then really empower the businesses to do the things that you have set in your strategy and where you believe they have the biggest impact. Um, what are some of the capabilities that you think are really important to have in a way centralized, like where you need to have a very tight control from a, you know, from a governance perspective? What are some of the, the things that you think you, it's very difficult to devolve? Um, Roz, I'll have a, a crack at that one first. Um, it, you know, our devolved model, we, we actually have sustainability teams at all of our operations. So we've, as you would expect with a different risk profile, we um, we do have quite a substantive team both at our operations and obviously at a smaller one in group. Uh, I think those elements about you know the the what we call a non-negotiable or the must-haves uh, are really around that material risk. They're the things that if those controls aren't in place, they can be quite catastrophic. Um, you know, and some of those are, are very operational, at least in our business. You know, I, I talked about tailings being one of those and, and the rigour and robustness that is around that. Um, but I think that just goes to the governance piece. So it's really around what are those material risks that are going to bring, um, you know, harm to the, the business, be it people, be it reputational, be it financial, but those things that, that really destabilise the business they're the musts and I think at a at a group level it's you know it's an obligation from that governance and oversight perspective to ensure that there is an oversight of how those risks are being controlled um, and that if they and and the other piece on that that lens is an independent eye to say uh, are they working as intended and what are we learning from that and and what are the improvements that we can make um, the other must um, as well is you know making making helping make those strategic choices so you know at a higher level you know what's what is the area that we're going to have the most impact but then also listening to see how we can create um, skills and knowledge and sources taking on key themes that are a bit more forward looking um, rather than the here and now which is very much with what boots on the ground and at, a, at that local level is um, so I think I think it is about running that balance um, but the other piece that maybe is not talked about a lot is that, you know, that social context, the way we do things around here is so important. And so the other must is that at a group level, you can't be deaf to that. You've got to really listen and lean in to your communities and to your sites. And, and that's a must for me as well, that, that really leaning in really understanding what's important at that grassroots level and taking that back and making sure we've got enough visibility to make sure that that's supported. Um, but Ros, yeah. I'm sure you've got some, some thoughts on that. So, um, and, and Ephraim, I'll hand back to you. Yeah, I mean, likewise, um, we have been very deliberate and shifted. I think, as I said, probably five years ago, it was much more reactive in the sustainability space. For the first time last year, we set targets and we've published them in our sustainability report. And as we move forward, challenging ourselves that we're not being too easy on ourselves or are these things now expectations of the community that that is just BAU. Um, we have in the sustainability team and in my team more broadly, obviously SMEs, 
but we also draw heavily where need be on externals because you know when as um, Fiona said you can't be everything to everything and you can't know everything in this space it is very broad um, and there are a lot of specialist um, consultancies out there who you know we draw on their expertise to help inform us and also benchmarking to see what's best practice and how we can constantly challenge ourselves to move up the curve. Yeah, so, so the, what I'm hearing is there are, you know, there are, you almost like run it like a, an internal ecosystem, but also even like beyond the organizational boundaries. And, and that's a really interesting um, framing that you kind of both did and, and it comes back to the, the notion of intentionality around skills and capabilities. Isn't that like that? That's one of the questions that I'd explore, like to explore with both of you, whether you've got your sustainability capability framework and, and, and understanding what skills you have and what you need, where you need complementary skills, um, either through uh, outside partners or building capability from within. How much of that is intentional or just emerges naturally from delivering the work on the ground? Uh, at, at, least for, at least for us, I think it is quite intentional. Um, you know, we've got very specialised skills, you know, as an example with the environment. So that I'm sure that would not be a surprise nor and it would be very similar to just about everyone on the call here. So, you know, where you've got domains around health and safety, um, complex technical and renovation, um, you know, and you've got regulatory requirements as well. I mean, you will have your, your SMEs there. Um, I think the other piece that for us, which has been very intentional, which in fairness wasn't quite well understood, and I could have probably communicated that better in the early days, apart from trust me, it's going to be needed, um, is really around looking at the reporting side of things. Uh, so we've got, you know, uh, a great team member who, um, his, uh, part of his title is ESG reporting. So we want to be able to celebrate the great things that we're doing. But sometimes it's about being able to package that up in a way that's digestible for the market. Uh, and I think that's something that's dramatically changed over the last two to three years is, you know, what are that portion of stakeholders needing to see and hear and in what format? Um, because, you know, certainly there isn't one way that that information's uh, going to come. Um, what I've also seen is, is a pretty big influx in the consulting world. And I've been around for a while. So I was around before the word sustainability was in play. So it's, it's interesting to watch all that is old is new again in some respects and um, unpack that a little. Um, so it is about reaching out, building trusted partnerships and, you know, some of some of this old stuff that's new again is refreshed and new, which is great. Um, there's a new lifeblood of passion that's coming back in uh, as it's got its prominence. Um, I think regardless of, you know, the, this intentionality is definitely there. Um, but again, we've got to be really careful about where, where we play. And I think it will continue to be a mix. Um, because we are talking about such a broad spectrum and some of it is complex and some of it is very technical and some of it is very legal, um, there are going to be a requirement for SMEs. There's going to be a requirement for generalists, but you do need to step up, look out and look at what, what's coming and be very, very intentional about if you're going to resource that in-house or out of house. Um, I've preference to do in-house because I think there's a lot of IP that comes with that but we've got some great partnerships with some great consultants that are also helping us so um, I feel feel like I'm sitting on the fence a lot but it, it's both yeah 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 that that makes that makes so much sense and um, um, and you know it's also the question that we often hear from our clients is around especially large organizations when they think about Multi, potentially also multi-business areas. The question is around the, not only the resource management, but also the career proposition more broadly for sustainability talent. I mean, at the moment, it's it's a, a great experience to have in your CV, but there's still the jury's out is to say, you know, is sustainability a long-term, almost like a, the new functional career that you do, 
or is that a valuable career experience on your journey to something else? Um, how, what's the, not the price tag, but the value attached to sustainability experience in, in your organization? Like if you assess an internal candidate with that experience to make the next move, how does that feature? I think it's becoming increasingly more and more important. I'm very fortunate our head of sustainability also is our head of corporate affairs. So talking to the point Fiona was saying about getting that message out to the market, she's fantastic at that. It's also, you know, what gets measured gets done. So having these metrics that the market can look to and targets and they can see how you're tracking, we engage very heavily and we work very closely with our investor relations team um, and our shareholders to get a really good sense of what they want to see from us, what's important to them. And um, even only on Monday at our investor presentation, sustainability featured very prominently in that. And I guess as an organisation and a purpose-led organisation, we're moving much more towards sustainability being just as important as the financial metrics when we go to the market. So I think in terms of careers, you know, I mean, a lot of companies now have chief sustainability officers. It's just becoming more and more important in business and in coming years, you know, it will hold the same um, position on the executive team as, you know, CROs, CFOs, in my view. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's great. And it's obviously, and you know, we come back to that. I'd love to hear your view on, you know, your recommendation for young talent starting their career in that space uh, later as well. And, and just, you, you touched on metrics a lot and it seems like that is a big part of your job, especially as the leader in that area. And, and I also heard that that's a part where you, central governance plays a key role, you know, to own the narrative, but also to own the data. Uh, and everything attached to it. And I don't know how many hundred different rankings there are, but there are hundreds out there. And uh, I understand you've made, you all made your choices where you contribute and where you don't <laughs> and, 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 and so on. Um, how do you manage and organize the numbers at, you know, uh, Rosalyn at, at NIB? And I'd love to hear also how this plays out uh, at Evolution Mining, but just, I mean, this is a whole of business numbers that, that you need to navigate all the time. Yeah, and ensuring that they're robust. Um, and I think part of the challenge for sustainability, and we're obviously seeing more uniformity as we're moving forward, particularly out of Glasgow, but I think that um, it has been, well, you're not really comparing apples with apples. What does that mean? But as we move forward, and to show the value of sustainability as well, um, and, you know, I know a lot of companies and we're certainly looking at that too, looking at our financial impact and how that um, interlaps with our materiality impact. Um, and, you know, obviously that's what the investment community are quite keen to hear. But from our um, perspective, you know, it's fed up to my team and we get, a, you know, the, those numbers are checked to make sure that they're um, robust and that we can report them to the market. I think as this um, evolves more and more, we'll only see that those numbers, that play out more. And as you know, in time, um, it will get an assurance over it like the financial reporting does. So we're looking at already, how can we get on the front foot in that space? Yeah, 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 great. And and um, and obviously that, that link to incentives uh, then, you know, obviously you've, there's a lot of data and metrics that you communicate externally and then mapping that then with the internal context. Be interested to hear, I mean, Fiona, you mentioned in the previous conversation that incentives is a way to, to anchor some of the sustainability efforts. What's your view on that and how do you navigate, you know, in, you know metrics and, and KPIs that are potentially linked with incentives, especially for the senior team? Uh, look, it's it's absolutely critical. Um, I think, you know, to to steal a a term from Jake uh, Klein, our executive chair, is is the train's already left. Um, 
if we've got, you know, you're, you're saying at the beginning, 80% of, of board members are talking about, you know, ESG, I'm surprised it's not 100. So I wonder where the 20% are. Um, and because of that, you know, it would, you know, undoubtedly be that, you know, your STIP and your LTIPs have got components of sustainability in them. We've certainly had them. Historically, you know, it has always been more the safety risk elements, but you're starting to see now with your net zero commitments um, and your progress against those, those are being linked in uh, and to your reward systems. Um, we've certainly got them. So, you know, that looks at um, your executive remuneration, that looks at your board, it looks at um, then your management that are a part of your, um, your STIP programs or your long-term incentive plans. We also then link uh, those incentives to what we do quarterly bonus, which is everyone in the business has sustainability metrics as part of that annual performance planning. Uh, that's embedded in it. And the way that that's measured and reported is, is quite transparent across the business and you're remunerated for it. Um, you've got to be really careful because you don't want to get go things um, push things underground um, and you want to be also very, very clear of what's important to the business. So it does link to that overarching strategy. Uh, I guess the other piece around that is that lens that um, what we're seeing from our reporting agencies is the expectation that that is actually in play. There are very open and, and uh, delving questions around that. How are you rewarding your executives? How are you rewarding your staff? You know, and, and its sustainability is expected to be part of that. Uh, and it does feature in, in conversations and questions uh, with the most senior, senior parts of our business and, you know, and we're quite open about that. Yeah, great. Yeah, this is uh, so, so much in Rich Connor. I can also see there are questions coming in through the Q&A box, which is good. And, and I think some of those are directly for you, Fiona and uh, Rosalind. So we'll pick them up, hopefully. So just before we go into the Q&A session, we have another quick poll that we'd like to, to do. And so basically, in a second, you'll see a window uh, emerging that asks what you think um, the number one challenge is in your organization uh, that it's impacting progress towards you know, advancing your sus sustainability goals. What is the number one challenge? And then obviously um, Fiona and, and Rosalie would love to hear <laughs> how much that aligns with the challenges that you are navigating on a daily basis. Great, so if you can select one of those um... One of those challenges, I'm sure there's a few, but uh, what's your number one challenge? Um, and we will then reflect on the results in a minute. All right. So according to uh, the group here today, um, the top challenge has been insufficient resourcing or capacity. Um, and that's followed by a lack of strategic alignment and um, related to that limited sponsorship and, and senior visibility. So um, interesting to see those coming through and wondering, you know, Fiona or Roz, have you experienced similar challenges um, or was there anything um, that, that was a bit different perhaps in your organisation? Um, yeah, that's probably a bit different to my experience in NIB, mm -hmm. but I, I think it probably depends a bit on the maturity of sustainability in an organisation and probably five, 10 years ago, sustainability was really finding it hard to get a voice. I do think though, if it's tied closely to the company's overarching purpose, it's going to get that visibility, visibility naturally. For me, one of the biggest challenges um, sustainability is facing and has faced is data and the reporting of data and meaningful data. Um, across the board and as I said that is going to change in the coming years but um, yeah I think some to, in the past sustainability has been a nice to have it's a bit of a soft thing that companies do but I think you know we've certainly seen over the past couple of years that has just shifted completely and the prominence is only um, getting more and more and as companies mature I think people will see that and you do know I mean I've got the buy-in obviously of my board and our CEO at the highest levels um, and that obviously is a contributing factor and you know as Fiona said her CEO is completely 
out there talking about it. So that's how, you know, you're going to get that prominence in an organisation. Mm. Yeah, that's fantastic. How about you, Fiona? Um, look, the lens that I put on it, anyone that knows me would know that I say this a, a, a bit, um, it, it doesn't matter what you care about as long as you care. And if you're in this space, find out what people care about. So if only people only care about money, you're going to be left behind if you're not caring about this. Um, if people care about, you know, people and at their heart, then, you know, this is about protecting the most vulnerable. So it's really important. Um, bottom line is that uh, unless you're on the train, you're going to be, you know, really hard to catch up. Um, I, I'm fortunate, you know, my role was created specifically because there was a will by the, by the company a couple of years ago. Um, but, you know, I've been in this space for a long, long time. I think we can take some lessons from, you know, back in the 80s around, you know, the conversations that were happening around risk and safety. I think let's take some lessons on that. This is now that it it's not sustainability should never be seen as a sit on the side. It is integrated into everything we do. Um, it needs to be viewed through that lens of contribution and value creation. And then if you're able to do that, then you can start to bring that wheel on board. And, and you, you, you know, it's our obligations as practitioners in this space to understand your PL, to understand the financial elements, to understand the soft elements and the hard elements, and to make sure that you're positioning it in a way that cares to the people that you're talking to. Because that's going to differ because we look at such a broad gamut um, across sustainability. You know, it's almost full circle. What do we mean by it? How do we have impact? Unless we're really kind of connecting with people on where that counts for them. Um, then that's the opportunity to get that buy-in. So maybe I'll just, I'll just flip that answer around in a different way. Yeah, yeah, that's great. And, and actually there are quite a few Q&A questions coming in and some of them, I might, I might start picking some of them up. Um, some of them are directly uh, addressed to you both, Fiona and, and, and Roslyn. One is around uh, materiality. Um, like how did you structure the data gathering and engagement process? And then uh, there's a, another question related to it or independently, can mater material assessment be incorporated with corporate risk assessment? Um, any tips, quick tips, or is that something you'd like to follow uh, up? I can, do a, I can do a quick tip, Ros, and you know, for, follow on, but I'm gonna be a bit black and white on that one. I, I think it depends where you are on your material, uh, on your, your maturity level. Uh, at one point in time, you've got to do a materiality risk assessment. It's got to be standalone. It can't just be incorporated. It has to actually have some grit uh, and, and you've got to get your stakeholders involved. So again, you've got to know who they are, engage them. Um, our approach was actually, we got some help. Uh, it is quite a bit of work pulling it all together, doing the interviews, um, you know, I've been party to some of them where, you know, I, you know, do a survey and the like, you can do it that way. It depends on where you are on your, materi on, on your maturity. Um, it depends on what you're going to do with it. Uh, but to answer that, I don't think it can be part of your corporate risk assessment process. That's a different process. Um, you can certainly update it. But if there's a point in time every few years, you've got to step back, you've got to look up and you've really got to have a look at doing an independent materiality risk assessment as a listed company it is also an expectation yeah I'd, yeah the yeah, thing i'd add there absolutely and this is somewhere where i think you do need to draw on external resources because there are um, organizations that specialize this and it is very time consuming and there's a lot of um, data that sits behind it and a lot of um, theory that sits behind it. It's not a straightforward thing. Um, and we certainly engaged an external consultant to assist us with that process. Yeah, yeah, that's great. And there, there's a question around, uh, you know, a lot of good work is happening at an organisational level. What could be done for greater collaboration across industries, uh, et cetera? Well, our observation is there is already a lot of that is happening, but it's also quite fragmented, isn't it? A lot of that collaboration is a subdomain of sustainability you now than within, within a sector. What's, what's your reflection on that? The value yeah. you get out of that? I mean, I think, I mean, I've got to catch up actually tomorrow with, you know, a round table of PHI, so private health insurers, um, sustainability is on the agenda. So I think often it is, has been quite industry based, but that's not surprising given that the focus of industries is quite different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, there's, there's opportunity, but I, I also love the opportunity for the rating agencies to get some alignment on, you know, what they're looking for. Yeah, yeah. A couple of more questions that I'm conscious of. We've got five minutes left in, in, um, in, in our session. If you could summarize, both of you, if you could summarize in a few short sentences, like reflecting on your career and obviously very esteemed career, what advice would you give someone starting out in sustainability? It's, the, you know, it's obviously a field where a lot of people are, you know, an aspiring field. What type of experiences and what type of pathways would you recommend someone? It's an interesting question because 27 years ago is when I was 20 and I was a lawyer um, for a long part of my career and moved in to risk. But what I'd say is it is definitely a career path now. Um, I don't think it's on your way to something else. I think it's, you know, something that will be in the C-suite on many listed companies going forward. And it's really about, I think, aligning the purpose of a company with your own values, where you wanna make an impact um, in your career and in your day-to-day -day life. And then making sure, you know, read, 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 get informed, get qualified as much as you can. Um, and I always say, don't ask, don't get. So put your hand up, you know, if there's an opportunity there that you, even if it's, um, and a project within the business so it's not part of your core remit if you put your hand up and then opportunities come up um, down the track it's I think it's and I think it's a fantastic um, pathway and career for many people in the future yeah it's, it's surprising we're from such different industries but we're really aligned in many many ways um, you know what advice would I would I give and or if I gave my younger self it would be um, you know, just be clear about the purpose and what impact that you actually want to have, but equally just get out there, like get any experience that you can take every opportunity that you can. The one thing about sustainability is, you know, I've been in the game 30 plus years, um, is that it changes all the time. So the thing that you think is going to be there in five years or 10 years with this hardwired map, probably not. Right. So, you know, the other piece around that is, um, you know, my my younger self had this, you know, uh, strategy, strategy. Well, your strategy is important, but you know what? Executing on it equally is so, or, or more so. And part of that is is really understanding, um, you know, the ideas that you have or the structures or the strategies that you have in place, how do they actually really work? Um, and so that you know, it links to Roz's comments around just get in there, get experience, take opportunities as they arise and go and find them. That's going to be the differentiator. There's not one path anymore. I mean, there's so many different avenues that, that what sustainability means today. So that if you want to be there, it's just about, you know, helping narrow down a little bit about where you want your impact to be and roll your sleeves up, like get in there. And um, it, it doesn't, this is one role though that doesn't work on the sidelines. So yeah. That would probably be the biggest advice that I can give you. Yeah, amazing. Yeah. Hey, thank you so much, Rosalind and Fiona, for generously sharing you know, your experiences and insights. You have obviously you have you have given us so much to think about, and I can see uh, in the chat and Q and A uh, there's there's a lot going on. Uh, I just as we come to the close of our webinar, and I know Fiona, you have you have a meeting with the minister, so you have to <laughs> jump off right at at, at two o'clock. So I'll just quickly just want to quickly share with with uh, uh, the participants that they will have access to the information, but also there is a series um, with great sessions that are actually coming up in a few weeks time. The, the next session that we're running is around uh, the closing to su the sustainability talent gap. And it's a fascinating, very dynamic space, as you heard from Roslyn and Fiona, so many different pathways into that space, but also we know from our remuneration and market data that actually there's a premium on very good and experienced sustainability talent at the moment in the market. It's a very contested and hot space. Um, we'll talk about that in March. In April, we'll talk about sustainability culture and the employee experience. And in fact, there's some fascinating research coming out of our global talent trends that shift from EX, 
meaning employee experience to life X. And uh, you know, Fiona and Russ would love to at some stage have you back on that as well and reflecting with this as a whole new piece around an awareness to dealing with finite energy in, in that context of, of designing your whole life. Um, and then the final one is around rewarding and measuring sustainability. And that goes really deep into how do you design incentives and what, what are some of the, the practices and, and um, regulatory imperatives around that as well, which is, is then in May. So we'll be sending out, we'll be sending out to you uh, the slides from today's session, but also you'll have access to uh, our point of view paper. Uh, the paper goes into much greater detail around the five dimensions around intentional design. You'll actually see case studies from NIB and evolution mining in the paper as well. Thank you, Fiona. Um, and also you'll have access to the recording of today's session. Uh, we'd love to hear also your feedback um, about the session today, because that will really help us inform uh, what we can do differently and better uh, uh, next time. So with this, I just wanted to, to say thank you very much for joining today's webinar. We really hope you enjoyed it. All the best. Thank you. Thank you.